Once we have outlets, computer outlets in every home, each of them hooked up to enormous libraries where anyone can ask any question and be given answers, be given reference material, be something you're interested in knowing. From an early age, however silly it might seem to someone else, that's what you're interested in. And you ask, and you can find out, and you can follow it up. And you can do it in your own home, in your, at your own speed, in your own direction, in your own time. Then everyone will enjoy learning. Nowadays, what people call learning is forced on you. And everyone is forced to learn the same thing on the same day at the same speed in class. And everyone is different. For some it goes too fast, for some too slow, for some in the wrong direction. But give them a chance, in addition to school, I don't say we abolish school, but in addition to school, to follow up their own bent from the start. Well, I love the, I love the vision, but what about, uh, what about the argument that machines, computers, dehumanize learning? Well, as a matter of fact, it's just the reverse. Uh, it seems to me that it's through this machine that for the first time we'll be able to have a one-to-one -one relationship between information source and information consumer, what so to mean? speak. Well, in the old days, in the old days you used to have tutors for children. A person who could afford it would hire a pedagogue, a tutor, and he would teach the children, and if he knew his job, he could adapt his teaching to the tastes and abilities of the students, you see. But how many people could afford to hire a pedagogue? Most children went uneducated. Then we reached the point where it's absolutely necessary to educate everybody. But the only way we could do it is to have one teacher for a great many of students, and in order to organize the situation properly, we gave them a curriculum to teach from. So how many teachers are good at this, too? Like in everything else, the number of teachers is far greater than the number of good teachers. So we, we either have a one-to-one -one relationship for the very few or a one-to-many relationship for the many. Now there's a possibility of a one-to-one -one relationship for the many. Everyone can have a teacher in the form of access to the gathered knowledge of the human species. Through the libraries that are connected to the computer That's right. in my, on my desk in my home. Right. I can sit there and call up, uh, well, what if I want to learn only about baseball? Well, that's all right. You learn all you want about baseball because the more you learn about baseball, the more you might grow interested in mathematics to try to figure out what they mean by those earned run averages and the batting averages and so on. You might, in the end, become more interested in math than baseball if you follow your own bent and you're not told. On the other hand, someone who is interested in mathematics may suddenly find himself very enticed by the problem of how you throw a curved ball. And he may find himself engaged in sports physics, so to speak. Well, why not? Why not? But you know, Dr. Asimov, we, we have such a spotty, in fact, we have such a miserable record in this country of providing, say, poor children, even with good classrooms. And I wonder if our society can ever harness itself to provide everyone, including poor children, with good computers. Perhaps not at the very start, you know. But uh, it's like asking yourself, is it possible to supply everybody in a nation with clean water? Now, there are many nations where it is impossible to get clean water except under very unusual circumstances. That was one reason why people started drinking beer and wine, because the alcohol killed the germs. If you didn't drink that, you died of cholera. Uh, but there are places where you can supply clean water for nearly everyone. Now, the United States probably supplies clean water for a larger percentage of, uh, percentage of its population than almost any other nation can. It's not that we would expect everybody to have a perfect computer right off, to have equal access to outlets, but you try for it. And with time, I think more and more will, just as for goodness sakes, when I was young, very few people had automobiles, very few people had telephones in the home. Almost nobody had an air conditioner. Now, these things are very common indeed, almost universal. It might be the same way. So you're, in a sense, every student 
has his or her own private school? Yes, and it belongs to him or her. He can be the sole dictator of what he is going to learn, of what he is going to study. Now, mind you, this is not all he's going to do. He'll still be going to school for some things that he has to know. Common knowledge, common database. Right, and interaction with other students and with teachers. You can't get away from that. But he's got to look forward to the fun in life, which is following his own bent. This revolution you're talking about, personal learning, it's not just for the young, is it? No, that's, that's a good point. No, it's not just for the young. That's another trouble with uh, education as we now have it. It is for the young, and people think of education as something that they can finish. And what's more, when they finish, that's a rite of passage into manhood. Real world. Right. I've finished, my, I've, I've finished with school. I'm no more a child. And therefore, anything that reminds you of school, reading books, having ideas, asking questions, that's kid stuff. Now you're an adult. You don't do that yeah, sort of right. thing anymore, you see? And in fact, like prison, the reward of school is getting out. <laughs> exactly. And kids begin to say, when you're getting out. And every kid knows that. Every kid knows the only reason he's in school is because he's a kid and little and weak. And as soon as he, and in fact, if he manages to get out early, if he drops out, why, he's just a premature man. Yeah. <laughs> so that's exactly right. In the city, I've talked to some of these dropouts, and they think they're there. They think they've become men because they're out of school. That's right. What's wrong with this? Well, what's wrong with it is you have everybody looking forward to no longer learning. And you make them ashamed afterwards of going back to learning. If you have something like this, then anyone, any age, can learn by himself, can continue to be interested. There's no reason, then, if you enjoy learning, why you should stop at a given age. People don't stop things they enjoy doing just because they reach a certain age. They don't stop playing tennis, tennis just because they turn 40. They don't stop with sex just because they turn 40. They keep it up as long as they can if they enjoy it. And learning will be the same thing. The trouble with learning is most people don't enjoy it because of the circumstances. Make it possible for them to enjoy learning, and they'll keep it up. There's the famous story about Oliver Wendell Holmes, who lived to be well into his 90s. He was in the hospital one time. He was, had not long to live. He was over 90 already. And uh, President Roosevelt came to see him. And there was Oliver Wendell Holmes reading a Greek grammar. And Roosevelt said, uh, why are you reading a Greek grammar, Mr. Holmes? And Mr. Holmes said, to improve my mind, Mr. President. <laughs>